and welcome to another edition of the On the Board Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Thomas, a.k.a. Sean T, a.k.a. Shawnee on the mic, a.k.a. I need to choose one name because I can't have three names. I am quarantined here in Queens, New York, joined by my main man, William Chirucci, a.k.a. We'll see. Will, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing all right. Can't complain. You know, it's Thursday, one more day till Friday, but every day feels like a Sunday here during this quarantine. So we just got to make the best of a bad situation and just want to give a shout out to all the essential workers out there, whether you're a cop, a fireman, EMT worker, construction worker, grocery store worker, fast food worker, or even a postal worker or whoever you may be that's essential. Just want to give a shout out to you guys. You guys are killing it each and every single day. So from the on the board sports team, we just want to say thank you. Well said, Will. Well said. Well, me and you were joined today by a very special guest. This man, I'm a big fan and supporter of his work. I get a chance to watch him a whole lot. Talking about from the Yes Network, the one, the only, Michael Grady. Michael, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Good to be on with you both, guys. Awesome. Thank you for coming on. Well, the floor is yours, sir. Michael, we know that you can't, you're part of the Yes Network right now, but you, can't, you come from Indiana. So what is that like? What was that like for you to come over and just basically, were you starstruck being in New York at the time? Or, you know, what, how did it all begin for you? Yeah, you know, um, I, I think there's just places in life where, where you're destined to be. And it might be exactly where you're at. It might be somewhere else. And there's this vibe, there's this energy that comes uh, um, uh, from that longing to be somewhere and there's a catalyst at some point and for me it was music and so um, I kid you not Nas, Biggie, Jay-Z, that whole thing the way that they painted pictures and the hustle and different things like that and as I got older and had interest in a lot of different things I just associated New York with people who just were on a hustle and I'm doing this but I'm also doing this and I'm doing that and the hustle and bustle of that whole thing I just really vibed with it so things were going well in Indiana for a long time um, loved Indiana. My family's there. But when I started visiting New York, it just felt right. It felt right. And then as my career started to progress, I felt like it was either LA, Miami, or New York. And I visited, um, I've, I've been to Miami the most, but I visited LA and New York like within a week of each other. And um, I, again, I had visited New York several times up to that point, but I knew I was making a career decision really soon. And I just, I was in LA for about five days and I was in New York for a weekend. And that was it. I was like, yeah, this is, is New York. And at that point, at that point, the job opportunity hadn't even materialized just yet. It was just, I knew in my heart, this is where I'm, this is where I'm meant to be. And uh, it just so happened to work out that way. So when I, when I, you know, stepped into New York, it was like, boom, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. It was, you know, I was ready to rock and roll, was not starstruck by anything, was not in, in awe of really anything. Um, I just was adjusting and processing on the fly because New York really doesn't give you time to adjust. And I love that about New York. That you don't even have time to tell, tell people where you're from. It's like, no, nah, you're a New Yorker now, go. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so that's a little background background on that, man. I've, I've loved the city and, and uh, time, is, time is flying. It hasn't been a long time since I moved here. It was uh, back in the uh, fall of 2017, but, uh, but time's flying by and I've loved it. Uh, since you've been here, is there like a favorite place you like to go eat? You like to go hang out and chill? Like, do you prefer like uh, Brooklyn over Queens, the city over the Bronx? You have like a little... Uh, yeah. Place? Yeah, you know, you know, loved all the boroughs, but you know, um, my first 14 months, I lived in um, uh, Brooklyn, right above the uh, the Barclays Center, and um, you know, never say never. I, I I could see myself all over New York and different places, Manhattan, Upper, Upper West Side, uh, different different places. Um, but if if I can get back to Brooklyn at some point, um, um, that would be you know be awesome because the way that they embrace me, the culture there. The um, uh, it, it it just it felt it felt right. It was what I needed at that particular time. Stepping in, it's just the way everybody embraces each other. Um, Sweet Chick was one of the first places that I went to that kind of felt like home, man, for the chicken and waffles, right. which was uh, which was fantastic, man. And um, uh, but uh, myself and my fiance, we hit different spots all around the city. So um, Sweet Chick is still a fave. Nobu is where we went for our first date. Um, so Nobu has a special place um, uh, with with me. Right. So, uh, but we hit a lot of different spots. But 
Um, it's all love in, in, in Brooklyn, man. It's all love there. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. So, can you just tell um, tell us how big is sports in Indiana? Because obviously, as we know, in New York, California, Texas, or Florida, these states that have a team for every sport, Indiana, besides the college teams, they only got the Pacers, the football team, and the um, and the Colts. So. Just how big and important is a sports in over there? Yeah, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a complicated thing. It's a fantastic sports city. Um, for There's a ton of race fans. Obviously, the Indy 500 is one of the biggest events, you know, right. in the country. Um, the huge Colts fans, huge Pacer fans, um, they back their teams. The complicated part is it's a small market. And so in doing radio in Indiana for a long time, it's easy to get disgruntled when they've had good teams in the past with Reggie Miller, uh, but they couldn't get past Chicago and the Bulls. Um, had a tough time with the Knicks during a stretch. Uh, get get um, developed and they're good once again, um, but can't get past other talented teams. Most recently, couldn't get past Miami with LeBron and Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh while they were trying to get it done with Paul George. Roy Hibbert, David Westland, Stevenson, and George Hill. And so there's that frustration there from a Pacers side of things that we're a small market. We can only build our team through a draft. It's tough to get free agents to come to Indiana. And, uh, and so sometimes that, sometimes that upsets fans. And if they feel like the team didn't have a real shot, you can see attendance dip and kind of fluctuate. Uh, as opposed to a larger market where, again, Knicks fans have been waiting 20 years for that pop, and they're still <laughs> showing up and ready to, you know, ready to go. Um, but it's easy to get discouraged from an Indiana standpoint. Um, the football team's a little bit different. Having Peyton Manning was a big time, like, luxury there in, the, in uh, Indianapolis. Um, but right now they're going through some growing pain since Andrew Luck retired. So it's a, it's a passionate, passionate fan base for sure. Uh, Indiana basketball is big, Purdue basketball, football to a certain extent, Notre Dame, of course, uh, northern part of the state. So it's, it's a big time, uh, big time uh, sports, sports city. Uh, it's just sometimes that small market thing uh, hurts. <laughs> it definitely does. So now you come to New York, you're working for Yes. Me and Will, we are big fans of Everyone that you work with from Ian and Eagle, Sarah, uh, Kustak, Ryan, um, uh, uh, Ruko, can you just tell us like how much of a joy has it been working with them and everyone else and just working for yes? Yeah, you know, um, New York has this kind of thing that, uh, you know, people are jerks or people are tough to work with and all those kind of things. And the folks that I've worked with at yes could not, I mean, they completely flipped that stereotype. Um, I didn't know what to expect. I was ready for anything, you know, coming from Indiana where people, you know, so nice and people, you know, that, that, that whole thing. And they are, it's tremendous um, from that standpoint, family feel. And then you go to New York and you're like, okay, all right, let's see, maybe a, maybe a tougher boss, maybe tougher people to work with. I don't know these personalities, maybe a lot of egos involved because we're talking about New York here, but man, everybody, I mean, they've all been, uh, unbelievable, man. They're like uh, family for sure. It's been amazing learning from Ian Eagle, who's so gracious with his time and is uh, is just a, a pro's pro. And Sarah Kustak is one of the nicest people that I've ever met and uh, and certainly one of the most talented. She just won an Emmy. Shout out to her. Shout out to Ian too, because he just won his fifth play-by-play -play, uh, New York Emmy in a row. Um, Ryan Rucco is uh, my guy and a pro's pro as well, extremely talented and one of the best around. And, uh, and we're, we're both connected because uh, we both got engaged not far apart. Um, and so, uh, so that's my guy, man. He's, he's, he's absolutely tremendous. Um, Richard Jefferson has been a, a pleasure to work with as well. Hilarious, um, a knucklehead. <laughs> And, uh, and extremely, extremely talented. I mean, he, he just continues to excel at, at, whatever, at whatever he does. And um, I remember watching him. One of the last games I went to as a fan was the Pacers playoff game against the Nets when, um, when uh, RJ was still playing with Vince Carter. And uh, I remember this, like, ferocious dunk he had down the middle of the lane. And so it's kind of one of those pinch yourself moments where I'm just like a fan sitting there with, my, you know, my people and watching the game. And then now... I get to work with him and the very last game that we did on yes network 
um, RJ and I called a portion of the game in the fourth quarter um, that the, that the, uh, the Nets ended up winning. So it's a tremendous group. And um, I, I didn't mention everybody, but we got guys, you know, from uh, Frank DeGrace, who just won an Emmy for Best Sports Producer, um, and our guys at the truck from Ryan, Ian, Dan Barr, our producer, or who, uh, our director, who won an Emmy himself. So I can go on and on. The, right. the squad is stacked. The squad is deep. Sorry for anybody that I left out. But it's a pleasure <laughs> to work with them all. Michael, you talk about, you know, those guys winning an Emmy. For you, going out there and working for the S Network right now, uh, as far as the Nets go right now, what, there's been a crazy growth. We know that the team five years ago lost out on a lot of first-round draft picks through the trade with Kevin Garnett, Paul Pierce, and Jason Terry going to the Celtics. Then they find their way with having D'Angelo Russell come over here after Brooke Lopez leaves from – Brooklyn to go to LA and now he's with Milwaukee. We know, we know that. My question for you is right now, with the growth that you've seen from 2017 on with this Nets team, what can you uh, tell us about this, this Nets franchise right now? Well, it's um, right now it's, they, they just want to get basketball rolling again. I mean, this is a right. team that after all the changes this past summer, it's we want to gel. We want to get everybody healthy. We want to get on the same page, develop that chemistry, and go on a championship run. And they haven't been able to do that. Uh, we knew Kevin Durant was going to take some time, of course, with that Achilles and take the season. And then all of a sudden, Kyrie Irving, little things started happening. There was the shoulder. There was the knee, the shoulder again. And you just haven't been able to see him out there on the floor consistently playing roughly 20 games. Karis LeVert was hurt at one particular point. Other role players were injured throughout the season. And so there was, there was this this frustration, if you will, that was really undeniable, that you just want everybody healthy. You just want to get everybody on the same page and continue to develop that chemistry. So for me, the, um, like personally, you know, if this team continued to be a 21 team, being in the New York market and being able to work closely with the basketball team would have been a huge blessing for me. Um, but there was something about the energy, you know, meeting with the folks at Yes Network, meeting with the people in Brooklyn for the first time, there was just this energy about Sean Marks and this calm that, yeah, things have not been good. You know, they were a 21 win team before I, before I hopped on board as a sideline reporter. Right. There was just this energy that good things are coming. And so to add D'Lo, go on a playoff run a year later, and then now to have Kyrie and Kevin Durant waiting in the wings to really take this team to an entirely different level. Huge optimism for the Nets. Huge optimism and huge upside and huge excitement for the franchise. That's definitely big, Tom. That's definitely big. And I'm a huge fan. I've been a fan since they weren't even here, since they were next door. So I've been a huge uh, fan. And, and I'm not wishing for the season to end, but I am so looking forward to the 2020 2021 season when everybody's yeah. good to go and healthy because the Barclays Center is going to be going crazy once everybody's ready to go healthy and ready to rock, man. So I know as a fan, I'm looking for it, and I know someone that's going to be there to see all those games. You are definitely looking for it. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a sleeping giant, man. And I know it <laughs> sounds like, uh, I, I, I mean, you know, I've been here three years. I don't know that anybody can call me a home or anything like that. But um, one of the things I love about the job is being able to travel and see different fan bases and see different, you know, uh, cultures. You know, going to see a game in Boston is very different than seeing a game in Sacramento. It's different than seeing a game in Atlanta. It's different than seeing a game in Dallas or Houston or Milwaukee. And um, there's, there are a lot of great fan bases out there. But there's, there's, just, there's just something about the Brooklyn crowd. I mean, they've been waiting on this. And I won't just say the Brooklyn crowd, but the Nets fan base. Right. Um, they've been waiting. They've been waiting for something special for a while, and just waiting to pop. And so we saw like a little glimpse of that in the way the fan base embraced that team a year ago, led by D'Angelo Russell getting to the playoffs and losing to the Sixers. And once, like, I don't think folks can imagine what it's like, what it's going to be like to hear Kevin Durant announced <laughs> in player intros at right. Barclays Center. You know, right. so um, so it's crazy. It's crazy. I, it's it's going to continue to blossom. My first game was a preseason game. Nets versus Knicks, and front row over here was uh, Floyd Mayweather Jr., and front row over here was Naomi Campbell. And I was like, whoa, this is, this is not Indiana. That was like, this is like, this is different, you know? 
And so I, I think it's preseason just, they're game. just waiting to pop preseason game. First one I ever did. I'm like, whoa. So it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a special venue. It's a special fan base and uh, they deserve a winner. So I can't wait to see what happens. Mike, who is one of your favorite idols growing up as far as broadcasting goes? Cause there have been a lot of, a lot of broadcasters out there, especially in the Midwest. So for you, who was your idol growing up as a broadcaster? Or a um, yeah, yeah, I have two, and I've, 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 um, I've stuck with it. There are a lot of people that I um, admire, but watching this Last Dance documentary is special for me because I grew up watching um, Ahmad Rashad and Inside Stuff and the way that he would uh, interview players and interview, and interview guys and talk about Talk about basketball, but talk about things outside of basketball, too. Um, you know, they may be on a bike run or he's throwing football with Michael Jordan, who, you know, everybody loved at that particular time. I had a love-hate relationship with Michael Jordan for a little while because Reggie Miller and the Pacers. Yeah. But he was definitely, you know, the GOAT in my eyes. And, and um, uh, by 1998, it was like, this is, this is that dude, you know. And so seeing Ahmad Rashad, like, kick, laugh and stuff and then get to – show a different side of Michael, not only Michael, but other great players at that particular time, man, that really appealed to me. And then um, Bob Costas, who called the NBA Finals in 1998, which I'm sure we'll see a lot more of in the documentary, just how polished um, uh, Costas was and is, and the way that he was all, he was, he was never flustered and always was prepared to put big moments in a historical context. I mean, imagine the pressure you would be feeling calling a game six. Michael Jordan could be his last game and the pressure you're feeling like, man, I got I to gotta make sure I capture the moment. Right. And I felt like he did it beautifully. And so those, I always wanted to be like a, a mesh of those two, like Ahmad Rashad and being able to connect with players on a different level and then share that with the fan base because I always think about myself sitting in front of the television like, wow, I get to see a different side of, Irie or Kevin or name whatever player and then when I'm and then when I'm calling games or announcing or whatever it may be just to be as you know polished as sharp a master of the vocabulary and, and the language um and uh and always prepared for the moment like Bob Costas is something that you know I'll, I'll always continue to strive for that's great that's great I go we can't let you go without getting your take on as you said the Jordan docu uh the momentary that's out now Parts one through four, we've all seen it, and I'm a big fan of it. What are your thoughts on the parts we've seen, and what are you most looking forward to seeing in parts five through ten? Yeah, you know, um, I, the Pistons thing was were, were two things. The first, the first two episodes were cool, um, but the last two that we just saw were like were um, amazing. One, I have been a big fan of Dennis Rodman, and I know that. When people mention Dennis Rodman, they think about the hair, how eccentric he is, the dress, all that type of stuff. Yep. And I get it. But man, this dude was six foot seven. And in one season with the Pistons, he was averaging 18.7 rebounds. In 1998, he was 36 years old and was pulling down 15 rebounds a game. Now, when we wax poetic about the 90s and that era, we talk about the fact that it was the era of the center, Akeem Olajuwon, David Robinson, Patrick Ewing. There are a number of centers, Brad Doherty, uh, Rick Smith with the Pacers. It's the era of the center. And this six, seven dude was pulling down 15 rebounds a game. And then 19 a game at his peak, six foot seven. So I don't know that that gets enough. And then never mind his defense, you know, and the fact that he was hounding guys on the perimeter, both inside and out. So um, hearing Rodman break down the rebound, and, you know, I studied these players, studied these guys, and I know when he shoots over here, I need to go this way. When he shoots over there, I need to go right here. And when he shoots, he tends to put a spin on the ball, and so I go in this direction. Like, that type of stuff, like showing his genius, I feel like it's been underappreciated for a long time. So I love that. And then, of course, you know, the Pistons walk off. Like, we were all waiting for that moment. Wanted to know what Isaiah had to say. Wanted to see Jordan's reaction to it. And I felt like that was an awesome moment. I wish Bill and Beer would have been a part of the documentary. I know he said his piece in the Bad Boys documentary, which is another great 30 for 30. But, um, uh, but Bill and Beer, Rick Mahorn, like getting more of their, uh, getting <laughs> more of the background on why they did what they did 
Uh, but seeing Horace Grant, Jordan, and Pippen's reaction to it, I thought was was beautiful. So I felt like that was that was amazing. Um, uh, the last episodes that we watched, and then I'm looking forward to um, you know seeing snippets. But I'm looking forward to Mike talking about you know the battle for the top two guard in the NBA with Clyde Drexler, which really wasn't even a battle. Um, and then going off for, for those threes in the first half. Charles Barkley hasn't made an appearance yet. So when we get to that third championship like that, Charles talking about battling Mike, that ought to be a lot of fun. Um, and then uh, and then we haven't got to the 72 and 10 season yet. So and then and then the, and then I hope Byron Russell is in the doc, documentary. So because I, I want to know what he has to say about the push off. That was a foul. And all that too. That so. was a <laughs> That was a clear foul. Right. Right. <laughs> right. I just want to hear Russell say it and I want to see what I want to see what Jordan says about it too. So sure. um and then and then of course being an Indiana guy, um, Jordan didn't have a lot of game sevens. Um, but he went game he went seven games with the Pacers in nineteen ninety eight and almost didn't have that opportunity to push off uh right. Russell in game six of the finals. So um so uh that I hope they document that series really well because that was a, that was the slug fest for sure. Mike, before we let you go, we mm -hmm. know that New York is a very big market. We know that New York is known for its basketball. But Indiana is the Hoosier State. Who is the best athlete that you've ever seen come out of Indiana? And number two, if you follow hoops at all or anything like that out there in Indiana, who is, gonna, who is the next best thing coming out of Indiana? Um, that's a good question. I got to be honest. I'm like, I'm so knee deep in New York now that I haven't followed the prep scene. And it's one of the things that I miss about Indiana because we follow the high school scene hard, like the local right. local news. You know, when I was out there, um, like just just before I came to New York, I was doing, you know, radio. I was working for the Pacers and I was doing I was a sports anchor in the evenings, too. And on mm -hmm. a Friday night during football season, I would go to like I would go to three or four high school football games to get video to bring back and cut highlights the high school basketball season go to three or four games cut highlights and that kind of thing and so um so it's, it's definitely one of the things that i miss um about indiana is watching guys before they get to that next level um and watching them just kind of dominate at the high school level so he's getting up there in age now but um eric gordon is a guy that i watched quite a bit uh, watched a ton of his games his senior year he lost in the state championship game to Etwan Moore. Etwan Moore might still be with the uh, the Pelicans, or he may be somewhere else. But Etwan Moore played for East Chicago Central and was a talented guy. But Eric Gordon dominated everybody, um, annihilated Jeff Teague uh, during a during a tournament game, uh, annihilated both of Jordan's sons. Both of Jordan's sons played on a team, and they came to Indiana. Their high school team came to Indiana and played against North Central High School where Eric Gordon was playing. Jordan came, it was the first time that I saw Jordan, could barely, you know, I just kept like glancing over at Jordan over there. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and Eric Gordon just completely just dominated that game. And um, it was fun to see, uh, for sure. So Eric is a guy that's in the league now that I have a connection with, but just about every, you know, Gordon Hayward, who's in the league now, he played at Brownsburg in Indiana. Uh, Jeff Teague, I mentioned, um, just about every Indiana guy that's in the NBA, I covered in some way, shape, or form uh, during my during my time there. So there have been a number of number of great players that have come out, and I'm 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 spacing on somebody, but Eric Gordon was the one that was a guy that I uh, I followed um, the closest. But the 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 history of like hoops and guys who came out of the the state is crazy. From Oscar Robinson, Larry Bird, of course. You know when you go when you go back for sure. So, um, but yeah, yeah, high school basketball is really it's, it's different there for sure. It's the Hoosier State, even Victor Oladipo, Indiana guy too. So, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, with IU, yeah, with IU. <laughs> so that's that's pretty huge right there. Michael, how do the people follow you on social media? Uh, on Twitter, it's uh, at Grady at G R A D Y on Twitter there, and then um, on Instagram uh, at the Michael Grady. Grady was taken. So I had to go uh, at the Michael Grady uh, on Instagram. You can find me there too. All right. That's perfect. Michael, man, thank you so much. I enjoy watching thank you, you. Uh, all the time. Keep up the great work and hopefully we get to see you soon because we don't know if it's coming yeah. back, when it's coming back. So hopefully we all get to see you uh, soon, man. Thank you so much. Yeah. I oh, appreciate you guys. Hopefully it's back soon. In the meantime, let's all stay safe. Really appreciate you guys. Good to be on with you.
Like with Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Really appreciate it. Be safe out there. That was the one and the only Michael Grady from the Yes Network. Will, before we end this episode, any final thoughts, sir? No, not really. You know, Michael was a gracious guest coming on and just talking with him, just really learning a lot about Indiana, Indiana hoops, and just the journey coming over here of becoming, you know, the sideline reporter that he is. And he's, he's a great personality, really is, and a smooth voice, too. Definitely, definitely, definitely smooth on the voice. Definitely smooth on the voice. And, yeah, you know what, Will, man, um, like you uh, said, so, so, I've been watching Matt since they – came over here and you know just seeing the work that he does and the part that he said that a lot of people do forget going on the road is not an easy thing it's really hard that kind of like he said covering a game in cali and texas florida it's different than covering a game here so having to adjust and adapt is something that he does really really well so it was a joy to uh interview him and um yeah you know hopefully we get to see him uh uh, uh coming soon but Right. NBA has to, you know, uh, decide when they're going to uh, bring back the games. Yep, absolutely. And they're looking about two, and it just came up Walt Disney. They're trying to play at Walt Disney. So that's something that's really interesting right there. But, hey, we'll see what happens. It, it's all it's all plans right now at this point. So we'll figure right. it out. We'll see what happens. All right. All right. So for Michael Grady from the Yes Network, that was my co-host, William Chuchi, a.k.a. We'll see. This was another edition of On The Board Sports. Sean Thomas, a.k.a. Sean T, a.k.a. Sean on the mic, signing out. And again, shout out to every essential worker and out there. I appreciate you guys. Talk to you guys soon. Peace out.